your fitness business podcast, Snapshot, the birth of the successful fitness challenge, the changes that had to take place, and the key marketing components that helped to make the fitness challenge a success. All of that and more coming up in today's show. Welcome to episode 305 of the industry's leading business podcast for fitness owners and managers. This month's interviews are brought to you by our podcast partner, MyZone, the wearable technology that enhances paid programming and drives customer engagement. To find out more, go to myzone.org. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Dory Nugent, and welcome to this week's episode with Mark Kaplan, the owner of Tribe Social Fitness, located in that country I believe they call Down Under, Australia. Before we learn more about Mark and how he changed up his fitness challenge, we will hear from Sarah from The Value Proposition. In this week's show, Sarah Pellegrino chats with an industry supplier to find out the value they bring to their customers and the industry. You will not only hear about the features of the product or service, which you can read on their websites or brochures, you will hear about the deep value and return of investment for you, the owner, manager, and team member. So let's hear from Sarah on who is this week's value proposition guest. So for this month's episode, we speak with the amazing team at PowerPlate. Mm -hmm. Uh, We speak to Julie Riker, Jeremy Daniel, Ian Murray, and Gary Lewis. Any club owner or operator who wants to learn how they can incorporate vibration technology into their clubs will want to tune in this month. You're going to learn the science behind PowerPlate, which is really important. I learned a ton the retail opportunities that PowerPlate provides. Every club owner out there wants to know how they can make more money, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to learn how the PowerPlate team customizes partnerships for each new organization that they team up with. And lastly, you're going to learn about the ongoing globally accredited education that keeps your staff and members engaged with PowerPlate products. Thanks, Sarah. This show will be live later this week on fitnessbusinesspodcast.com and our video interview will be on our YouTube channel, so just search Fitness Business Podcast. In today's episode, Mark is going to explain to us how he took that old school fitness contest and transformed it into a highly successful new contest that provided his club not only a turnaround in retention, but encouraged friendships and camaraderie amongst his members. Now, Mark has owned fitness businesses since 2004, and he loves all things fitness and all things business. Sure, he has made plenty of mistakes, but he's also had many successes. But he really is truly passionate about continued learning and development. His current club, Tribe Social Fitness, is a culmination of everything Mark believes in. Fun, teamwork, positive culture, and continued development. Listen today how Mark has put a slightly different spin on his new and improved fitness contest. But before we transition into this week's interview, let's first hear a quick message from our friends at MyZone. MyZone is the industry's leading wearable technology platform that drives engagement and provides personal feedback and motivation through gamification, wherever your members choose to work out. Go digital to provide a hybrid offering. Your members will love you for it. Learn more at myzone.org. All right, everybody, are you ready to go? Let's get started with our interview. FBP family, I give you Mark Kaplan. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the Fitness Business Podcast. I believe this is your first time joining us, correct? It is, yep. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Oh, yeah, we are super excited. So you've been in the industry since 1999. You started Mm -hmm. out as a personal trainer. Uh-huh. Yeah, I did that for five years, full-time, the grind of one-on-one personal training. 
And then I, I went on to opening up fitness businesses after that. Yes. And now you are a studio owner, correct? Of uh, mm-hmm. Tribe Social Fitness. Yeah. Tribe Social Fitness. I've had that for nine years now. Uh, going strong. Loving it. Why don't you tell our, our listeners a little bit about Tribe Social Fitness? Cool name. I love the name. Um, mm. Kind of speaks, I think, to, to what the energy and the vibe is. I feel we nailed the name back, yeah, nine years ago. It really does embody and tell a story of exactly what we're about, Tribe Social Fitness, you know, bringing people together through fitness, building a strong community, building strong relationships. We very much believe that the whole exercise and health and fitness journey can be quite boring and hard sometimes, especially if you're doing it by yourself. So enter social fitness, tribe, family, together, on that journey with two or three or four or 20 friends, it makes it much more, you know, um, enjoyable and therefore long-term. So that's how, that's pretty much what backs Tribe Social Fitness up. Okay. So you're in Sydney. Is the, is Tribe Social Fitness in Sydney, Australia? Correct. Yep. We're so- in Sydney, Australia in a little place called God's Country. We like to refer it to. <laughs> the well, Sutherland that- Shire. <laughs> okay. I'll be, the there- Carla Sharks. <laughs> I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to assume, I haven't been there, but I'm going to assume that there's many fitness studios in that location. But from Mm -hmm. what I understand that sets you apart from everybody else is your secret is your fitness challenges or your team challenges. Yeah, it's one of the things that we do and we're proud of. We've always done challenges, but more so the way we have changed to do them in the last 18 months. It's really helped us set ourselves apart from our competitors, yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm going to give a couple little stats here. In October 2019, you sold 381 spots in your challenge in 90 seconds. What was the challenge? So it's a fat loss challenge. It's a weight loss challenge. No different to many other gyms that do that throughout Australia. And we had a four-week marketing campaign leading up to the go time for registrations. And, yeah, we were able to sell 380 in 90 seconds. So it's, we, we had capacity of 400, so we didn't quite sell out in the, the goal of 10 minutes. But, um, you know, we went close. Okay, so I have a feeling all of our listeners right now, their jaws are dropping. They would only mm-hmm. dream to sell 380 spots in 90 seconds. So I'm yeah. going to... I'm going to ask you some questions. We're going to peel away at this a little bit just so our listeners can maybe take some notes and, and maybe change how they're running their challenges to become a little bit more successful. So first one, why, do you, why did you get such massive member engagement? It's a good question. There's a couple of answers to that. I think number one is we do have a fairly tight community. So generally whatever we put up in lights for our next event our members gravitate toward quite well. They like us, they trust us, they get excited for the things that we do put on. But the real, the probably the bigger thing was the way we changed the challenges in, in regards to the way we do them. We always did them a certain way and they were poor to fair at best. Mm-hmm. Looking back on it, it's not the best way to do a challenge uh, the way we used to do them. And then we just changed and, and, and the, and the yeah, it's been amazing. The, the uptake, the completion rate, the benefits, not only from getting, you know, 400 people into a challenge, but the, the benefits that spiral afterward have been huge. Okay. So let's talk numbers. How um, much did it cost a member to join the challenge? Yeah, it's a good question. So it co- there were two options, the $117 option, option one, or $300 option, option two. Okay, and which did you find was more popular? Well, it's a good question as well. It's like, for us, it's about just getting them into the challenge okay. and then the magic happens and I'll talk about that after. Mm-hmm. I didn't really mind which option they took. I just preferred wh- whichever was best for them financially and obviously there were two different uh, inclusions for option one and option two. It didn't really matter how which option they took, just mm-hmm. get into the challenge. Good. Well, I like that you gave them a choice. And then how much did it cost you per person as a club yeah. owner? Okay, so because there were two prices, $117 and $300, I didn't really look at it, look at it as a per-person cost. 
but I do know that the challenge cost $85,000 to put on. When you include everything, marketing, the wages, the prizes, uh, I have a list here that I can go through some things. Uh, yeah, so 85,000. So the profit was $5,000. So, you know, we, we had an income of 90, 90 and an expenses of 85,000. You may ask the question, well, why the hell would you put it on? Because it does require a lot of work. There's a four week marketing campaign leading up to registration day. Then from there, there's a two week prep phase, an actual four week challenge. So there's another six weeks, but even prior to the marketing campaign, our, our marketing events coordinator is getting everything ready, the teams, the concept, the idea, the times, the locations, all that type of thing. So it's really a, a four plus four plus four. What's that? Eight, that's 14 weeks. It's like three months of the year dedicated to the challenge for a $5,000 profit. You would think we're crazy, but there have been many other benefits financially that we're very happy to do the challenges the way we do them. And do you find that you have a lot of the same people entering into the contest it's a good question we do and it's one of the challenges that we have for the challenge it's to get you know how you have your top 20 percent and then your middle 70 percent your bottom 10 percent of anything or oh, our, our, our top so we have 900 members so what's 20 percent of that well 10 percent is 90 so that's 180 people so we, we sell 180 like that it's a given and then it, the, the next 200 come from the 70 percent but we're really trying to get the other three to 400 members involved in our challenges as well. That's one of our current things we're working on. Okay. So let's talk about um, logistically how you get everybody to sign up for this challenge. What we did with the challenge is the way we turned the chairs around to just create something different is we just created captains and coaches and we created teams. So rather than have 300 people do a challenge in one big group, yet they were doing it individually, we then created 10 teams, 40 people per team, and three leaders per team. So all of a sudden, it's smaller within a bigger environment. You're in a group of 40, and you're looking to your three leaders. And I think the one of the great things about the challenge is the three leaders. Guess who the three leaders are? I'm going to say um, your members, three of your members. You're 20%. Yeah, no. You're 20%. Two members and one trainer at Tribe. Okay. So we have a captain. Oh, sorry, we have two captains and one coach. Um, so the coach is a trainer, and that's the person that does all of the nutrition prescription and the exercise planning for the people within the team. And then you have the captains, who are two members, who really are role models. They're inspirational, um, and 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 people look up to them. So. Your question was like, how do we do it? Well, it's a better concept to sell is how we did, how we did, how we did it, how people get engaged, how they get involved is they look at that product and they think to themselves, ah, oh, yeah, I actually would like to get involved in that. The change yep. for you was to go to the concept of the two coaches, right? There are the two captains and one coach, yep. correct? Yep. So how do you determine who the captains are. They all like duking it out, yeah. fighting over who's going to be the captain. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. So we, are, we have done three challenges like this now. The first one, we picked them. We went to them and picked them. And that was great. And they were honoured and humbled. But can you see a problem there? Mm -hmm. So it's like, what about the people we didn't ask to be yeah. a captain? Yeah. So that was a problem. So there's a little bit of a... Uh, so I'll talk about some negatives of the challenge as well later on that I've learned in hindsight because it has not a lot but a, a little bit of drama among the membership base. I didn't get picked. Why didn't I get picked? Because you're crap. That's why. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> it's like creating sorority. It's like you got sorority girls, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, it, it was interesting. It's, it, it shows sort of the passion within our member base, you know. Anyway, the second challenge we went out and we said, okay, apply. Mm. So we asked the members to apply to be a captain and we had uh, it's like 25 to 30 applications, which I was happy with because just between you and me and everyone else who's listening, um, I already knew who I wanted my captains to be and I applied. I asked them to apply so that I could remove myself from the political drama of not asking them. But when we had of the 25 to 30 that applied, 20 were like, yes, I'm glad they applied because they're on my list. But then you have 10 apply, they're like, oh, they're not going to be a good captain. Now I, now I need to go and talk to them about why they're not getting picked. 
So I, I, I handled that well. I just had one-on-one -on -one conversations with them in person to explain why. Yeah, I could see where that would be tricky, you know, mm. in, in all aspects. Yeah, you know, you don't get picked. Everybody has that little bit of disappointment and why. And yeah, I guess, yeah. you know, you, you risk them leaving the club because they're, they're hurt yes. or why they weren't selected. So I'm sure that took a little bit of ironing out, figuring out the best process on how to select your captains. So it sounds yeah. like trial and error. Great. So those that you finally do select, Mark, for captains, mm -hmm. what do they get a reward? Do they get, like, do you give them anything? For, for yeah, we give them, what's, uh, I'll get my calculator out. We give them 25 group personal training sessions. So what's that? I should know this. I'm, yeah, it's $625 worth of value. So we do membership at Tribe, we do group personal training, we do one-on-one -on -one personal training. So they get they receive 25 group personal training sessions. So that's $625 worth of value. Okay. So you you talked a little bit about the role of the coach, which is the trainer, correct? What about correct. the captains? What's their role? Great question. So it's to inspire the members to become better versions of themselves and a really and when i say that like to inspire it's it's basically to get them to feel comfortable and and commit to the program and 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 do what they said they're going to do but along that way that journey as well introduce them to other people within the team this is what i refer to the magic this is the magic of the challenge mm -hmm. is there's there's two there's two things i want to talk about here number one is when someone comes into a group of 40 within a gym of 900 members. So they walk into a gym of 900 members, it, it's a little bit scary. We're, we're not a small studio, but we're not a big 3,000 member gym either, but we're in between. But we're all about how do we bring small into a larger club? Well, a group of 40 does that. So the captain's role is to get that new person who doesn't know any of the other 39 people and actually introduce them to other people and enable them to feel comfortable. That's a huge role of the captains. And the other role is best, uh, I guess, depicted from a story that I would like to quickly tell you, and it's this. In our first challenge, I, I lead a team. Um, it's a competition, by the way. I get a little bit competitive in the challenges. But anyway, and I had my two captains, and my two captains, Lauren and Ashley, they fantastic. And I remember we were halfway through the challenge, and I said, we are nailing this. Everyone in our group is doing fantastic. We're going to win for sure. Um, and I said, what about Sally? Sally is going fantastic. I said this to my captains. Sally is a member within our team. Her goal was to lose four kilos. And she, Lauren said to me, Sally's going fantastic. I said, yeah, she's completing a training plan and she's eating really well. And she, Lauren, the captain, had a puzzled look on her face. And I said, what? And she said, Sally's not doing well. And I said, oh, yeah, no, she's, I was on the phone to Sally last night. Sally's doing great. She's following the program. And Lauren said, She's not. I said, listen, I've been doing this for years. I'm pretty sure I know if someone's on off, you know. <laughs> and she said, Mark, um, I've been talking to her every second of the day. She's telling you she's doing the program probably, but she's eating half a block of chocolate every night. And I went, wow. So for me, that is the that is just gold. That's the magic. The, the member feels more comfortable with the captain sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, uh, than a trainer an intimidating trainer who's apparently perfect all the time which i'm definitely not does that make sense complete sense now let's move on to the coaches aka mm -hmm. the personal trainers mm -hmm. do they get paid any extra with the challenges yeah they get paid 1500 dollars extra for their time during the two-week prep phase and the actual four-week challenge because it takes anywhere from four to six hours of the trainer's time per week when you do the math on that, for us, it works out anywhere from $40 to $50 per hour that we pay our trainers to do. It's work on top of their normal schedule of one-on-one -on -one personal training and taking classes. So it's quite taxing on the trainers, the actual challenge, from an energy point of view. And as the owner of the studio, what, what are your expectations for your trainers? What are they supposed to be doing different during the challenge? So they're, they're meant to be holding everyone accountable to the plan. So with the challenge, there's a closed Facebook community group for the 40 people within, and the coach, the trainer, leads that. So they'll be posting three times per week within and then responding to all the questions and the comments within. So staying on top of that is a big role 
of the of the trainer of the coach. They also have a week. Every team has a weekly exercise outdoor catch up session. So that's an hour, and the coach will spend the first five or ten minutes talking to their team about whatever the coach wants to talk about: nutrition, exercise, winning, losing, whatever it might be. And then they exercise together as a team. So the the coach, the trainer leads that. Okay. And then on top of that, how many times do the teams meet during the week? So once. They just meet once. Just the once. Yeah. And, the, and then that's... Anything more would be just overkill. Yeah. Okay. And then is the coach responsible? Like, do they reach out during the week to each individual team member? Yes. Or is it always just done within the group, like within the Facebook no, it's, coach group? That's another part of it as well. So it's text messaging once per week some of the bet like some of the better this is where it gets a little bit interesting amongst the trainers and the coaches because again even with our team or our staff you have some trainers that just get in there and give it everything they have and others do good and others just do just get by so that's a challenge within itself but some trainers are messaging their their people every second day or every day Um, some trainers are just once a week so let's just shift gears a little bit rewinding back to the beginning and we talked that the challenge it's it's about a three-month process Uh um, from the start of the planning to the finish of the challenge the marketing aspect of it yes let's strip it down what kind of marketing is your team doing for the challenge yeah so it's a four-week marketing campaign leading up to sunday 3 p.m so when i say sunday 3 p.m you know when um Pink does a concert and she releases the tickets and that goes on sale. That's how we do the challenge. So we have a four week marketing campaign leading up to the Sunday, 3 PM go time. And then that's when registrations are open on that Sunday, 3 PM and members click on the link, choose their team, get their spot. So that's how we sold 381 in 90 seconds when they were just click, 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 click. Fantastic. But what led up to the four weeks? So just a lot of internal marketing. So it starts with a a 60 second video from the captains and the coach, the three of them together in front of the camera, telling them why they should join their team, what they're about. Lots of posters throughout the studio as well. And about 6 million text messages from us to the members promoting bits and pieces of the challenge. The 60 second video. I I love the 60 second video. I'm going to assume you're pushing that out through... Facebook, your, your social media platforms, Instagram, correct. am I correct? Yes, both, yes. Okay, so just to recap, we've got the 60-second video, the posters, which is we'll consider internal marketing, and then you will also work through your mass tech system and you're pushing mm-hmm. information out that way. That's, that's pretty much the marketing plan for the most part. And the fourth is when trainers and members walk around and literally recruit in person. Okay, so in-person recruiting. Yeah, but we have a bit of a, it, it, we bit ourselves on the bottom a little bit there in, in the first couple of challenges. It's like you would walk past one member to recruit another. That's not good. So we don't, we try to pull back on that now and we just let the actual marketing speak for itself. Yeah, again, I could you know see. What I mean? oh, yeah. <laughs> Come join my team. But then there's someone there, I don't want you on my team, you know, so you got to be careful. That is, that's tough. You're right. Because I think in a club people they join and then they want to feel a part of it you're working your best uh, mm. you know every day of the year to try to make sure they feel that way and then a challenge comes along and now all of a sudden you're kind of brushing them aside you know going to the person behind them and I could understand why they would feelings would be hurt especially because they yeah. look to you as oh I love this place and they're selling it out amongst their friends and then in the same breath it's like you know they're not getting asked to be on a team so yeah. That's tough, but I'm sure you just figure it out. And like you said, sounds like you've just kind of each time you host the challenge, you get better and better and, and fix the correct. Yeah. yeah, correct. All right. So let's talk about the challenge that as your business, the challenges as far as member retention. I mean, I think yeah. it's a no brainer that it's probably a, a major retention for you. Mm. It's huge. This is where financially it, it makes it everything worthwhile. So we're a 900 member club, and before we started doing the challenges this way, we would we it's embarrassing for me to say, but it's just truth. We would get 45 to 50 cancellations per month. That's a lot of cancellations. Now we get anywhere from 20 to 24. And I'm not saying the challenges are 
solely the reason for that. We've done some other things to help with our member retention, but it's a big part of it. When, when people know people and they're friends with people, they don't leave the gym. Mm -hmm. Fact. You know, and in, in a, in, if anyone's listening out there and they have, I would say, 500 members or more, I'm calling that hard, a hard environment to connect people. 200 members, smaller clubs like that, easier to connect people for obvious reasons. But as soon as you've got 500 or more, it's harder. So you have to ask the question, how do I bring small into like small into a bigger club? And, and it's like groups of 40. You know, you said a good thing right there. I had a, um, a we have an episode with a group fitness director. Her name was Ingrid Knight Kogi, and she had the coolest quote and she said people won't quit a friend but they'll quit a treadmill so I, I think that fits with your you know so what you're true. talking about with the retention and the, okay. the contest and walking in and you know that's yep. their teammate and their friends it's, it's like we always say the strength comes from within the tribe and i'm just as a business owner you get sick of <laughs> retaining members putting all your energy into it because in the past, it was like, who, who retains the members? I do, plus all of our 10 staff. Well, that's a little bit silly. Let's use our members to retain the members. Then that's what we do. Oh, I like that. There's a good quote. Members retain members. You can use that members. one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're giving Ingrid a run for her money on quotes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, you know, you're the owner. You've been there. You're part of the contest. You've seen the before and the after with the change in the contest. Just talk a little bit about the difference you've seen in morale between the old contest and the new contest amongst your staff mm -hmm. and, again, amongst mm -hmm. your members. Yeah, amongst the members, a, a flashback just jumped into my mind. I remember after our last October challenge, I was training one of our members. Um, I was actually talking to one of our members, sorry, who was training. And this was in December. The challenge had finished. And I looked over to the water fountain out where people drink water. And um, there was an elderly gentleman, David, who's around 65 years old, talking to another member, Sarah, who's in her mid-30s. And they were in the team together previously in the October Challenge. And it's just a very small thing, but there's no way in the world those two would have actually had a conversation mm. in tribe had it not been for the challenge. And they stood there, stood there and spoke for five to 10 minutes. I'm thinking to myself, that's where the magic is. Just connecting people. Uh, it gives me a goosebump. It's actually so simple, but it is, it's, it's effective. If you do the numbers on not losing 20 members per month, our, our, our annual membership is $1,800. You, you can't not do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then within the staff, <laughs> yeah, so it gets a bit competitive. In our first challenge, it got a little bit competitive. So we had problems. So it's not everyone's competitive. And the ones that are competitive love it. They're like, you know, and there is a bit of trash talk on the gym floor. And we had to, you've got to manage that because you don't want to pull it back to zero because it's actually, it adds to the element. It adds to the spirit. But some of our, men, our, our trainers who aren't competitive, it crushed them a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we have to just manage that. But as far as morale is concerned, well, the trains are earning more money. They're busier, and they're feeling like they're feeling like they're leading. They're leading a team of forty, so they feel uh, more significant. Well, they are more significant. So it's 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 huge for morale. Yeah, who would have thought, as a business owner, when during a contest that you have to wear so many different hats? Because, like you said, yeah. you've got to put out the fire, the hat, and you put this hat on to put the fire out because, yeah, you've yeah. got too much competitiveness <laughs> between this group, and then this person's feelings are hurt, so you've got to turn the hat, put on the psychology hat because their feelings are hurt because they weren't maybe asked to be on a specific yeah. team. It's crazy, isn't it? One of, my, one of our coaches, and, and, and is an excellent trainer, said to me, um, oh, I just don't know if I would want to be a coach in the next challenge because... I, my team, you know, generally doesn't do that well. And I'm like, and in my head, I'm I'm just, I'm thinking, is this actually happening? I'm like, how about you just get better, you know? And and I massage that conversation into that is the outcome. You just got to get better. It's how, how good is that? It's, it does expose our coaches a little bit, our trainers. So there's a fine line. You've got to, man, you've got to be on top of that. You've got to manage that, making sure that trainers don't finish the challenge, feeling bad about themselves. It's really important. Because we've got some dominant trainers here who sort of, you know, rise to the top pretty quickly. Yeah, I think 
Yeah, I think every club has that, you know. Yeah. You know, with my club, it's the same. It's it, I like you talking about this, and I'm like, and I'm putting different trainers in the different categories because yeah. I've seen it even when we do our challenges. Again, same, same exact. Just you know that we're in the U.S., but same exact situation. Yeah. So let's just talk about sales with the mm-hmm. competition and how you've seen the the competition increase sales. And are you getting people walking through the door, basically raising their hand, going, "Hey, I'm here because I hear about this amazing challenge mm. that your club offers." No, we're not. It's something we need to get better at. Is it's a, it's actually a good conversation. So. When I say no, we're not. There's a reason we have not. I've always said I just want to market the challenge internally. We have 900 members, and for us, that's where we want to sit with our members. So our goal at the moment with our business is just replace the members we lose. So we don't need huge influxes of members on a monthly basis or at a particular time of the year to sort of keep the business going, if you like. Actually, post-COVID, we need a few more members. But anyway, um, it's I, I just love doing internal marketing for the challenge. Just getting the members involved, as you say, people don't leave a treadmill. They would have. What did you say? People they don't, don't leave a friend. They don't a quit a, Yeah, they don't quit a friend, but they'll quit a treadmill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like a lot of clubs do. We and I have anyway. Waste a lot of money, external, external, external. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in. You know, and it's a cliche, but how about you focus on the ones you have? Okay. One more question. Let's talk mm-hmm. about. The social aspect that I that the contest is is creating amongst the teams. Do you find that the teams or do your any of your coaches take the team outside of the club and do anything there? Happy hour, um, yeah. maybe an extra group run at a park. Do do they do anything like that, or is that not part of the? No, they do. Goals? Other some of the trainers or the coaches all of a sudden they're doing two weekly catch ups and they're like. Oh, that's interesting. Is that, do we put a rule around that and say you can't do that? And our marketing and events person's coming to me saying, we need to stop that. I'm like, you know what? Let them go. Let them, let, let the coaches and the trainers have a bit of flair, have a bit of ownership, do their own thing. And if they want to do more, let them do more. And then we, it always culminates our challenges in a social at the end, bringing out the social and tribe social fitness. And it was funny. It was, okay, everyone, three o'clock at this local pub is where we catch up mm-hmm. on a Saturday afternoon for our award ceremony and that type of thing. And then I got there at 2.30 uh, early to organise and prep. And there were four other teams who had already been there from 2 o'clock catching up together. So that's pretty cool. Get your pen ready now for Keep Me's Fit Bizpiration. Okay, Mark, what are your three tips to move from old school challenges to your tribe team style challenges? Three tips. Number one would be to analyze your current completion statistics of your challenges and ask yourself, are you happy with that? And if not, change. So obviously just recognizing where you're currently at, number one. Number two would be just the real success comes in obviously getting people on board. So giving yourself plenty of time to market the challenge properly. And then number three would be delivery, making sure that you deliver on the product. So there's two parts of it, isn't there? There's the marketing and then there's the delivery of the, of the actual product as well. So making sure that you choose your captains really well and making sure your coaches are on board and on the entire time. Keep me smarter member retention. Keep me.ai. Let's get back to our show. Thank you so much for coming on to the Fitness Business Podcast. Again, I think your episode today is going to inspire so many of our listeners and hopefully get a lot of the owners and the trainers out there to add a little creativity to their fitness challenges. My pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Wow. After listening to the success of Mark's Fitness Contest, aren't you just wanting to make changes in your facility? It's always great to meet friends in the industry that have found what works for them and their facility. So a big thank you to Mark Kaplan for sharing his success with all of us. Now, here's a message from our podcast partner, Jim Sales. 
GymSales allows you to plan, implement, and monitor a proactive sales strategy that's automated and uniform. You can give your sales team the tools they need to capture, nurture, and convert new members, which means it's easier than ever before to grow your member base. Make sure you head over to gymsales.net to find out more information. Quick Fire 5. Enjoy this week's Quick Fire 5 with our special guest, Sarah Cooperman. Hi, Sarah. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for coming on the Fitness Business Podcast. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. I love this. I listen to it uh, religiously. <laughs> I think it, it makes you think. It just Thank you. knocks you out of the regular. Awesome. Well, we're going to get you thinking and we're going to do our quick fire five questions. So we're going to get started with the first one. And that one is who inspires you in life and why? My husband is wonderful and I can always bounce an idea off of him or get information that I need. He deals a lot with the SBA, with the Small Business Administration, and he's always consulting with different businesses And he looks at the trends of what's going on. So it takes me outside of the industry. And that's what I think we need to do. We need to stop being so incestuous into what's going on exactly in in our country, in our state, in our neighborhood. And we need to broaden that base. And even going outside the industry, I think, is a cool idea. All right. Awesome. I love the answer. Number two, why do you do what you do? (laughs) Because I don't think... I don't think I could do anything else. I don't think anyone would put up with me. Um, All right, I'll, I'll take that for an answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So then my, it ties right into our next one. If you were not doing what you were doing, what would you be doing? Oh, I know exactly. Okay. I think I would love, I can't even believe I'm going to say this is humiliating. I would love to be like a police officer, an FBI agent, and doing good for our country and researching. And I don't know, I, I want to be the good guy. I think that's why I went to law school is, and I thought I was going to go into criminal law because I did work as an assistant state's attorney uh, during a summer. And I, I don't know. It's like, I just, I want to be a good guy. I don't know. Oh my God, I love that. So patriotic. Very nice. We learned something about Sarah Cooperman. (laughs) It's humiliating. (laughs) All right. What's one book, podcast, blog, or Facebook group that you could recommend to our listeners and why? I think most people who know me that know that, I don't want to say I'm not a big reader. I used to be a really like a big reader. And then when the business grew and grew and grew and all I do all day long is read emails. All I want to do is watch Park and Rec. So I love Park and Rec, Grey's Anatomy, The Office. So I think that I recommend doing stupid things that that warm your heart. So, but now going back to the book, the person I really love is Malcolm Gladwell. So that if if there's any books that I recommend... I love what the dog saw, Blink. You know, I I just think, be, and he has a wonderful podcast right now. I can't even remember what it's called. I've got it on my phone right here. But it's a terrific podcast. And I'm looking here. Right now I'm listening to Hamlet Was Wrong. And, oh, um, it's, let me look here. What is this called? Revisionist History. Okay. That's what it's called. All right. And then finally, yes. we're going to ask you, what will be one action item that you're going to talk about in your upcoming episode? Oh, oh, action item. I've got two things that we're doing. We're doing, I'm doing one thing. I'm trying to finish my book. It's been a very long struggle for me just because I get so pulled into the business. So I do have a book that I, I it is going to come out in 2021 if it kills me. And we, we do a live stream convention which I love. And we're helping instructors live stream their sessions through a a little website. We're talking train with the trainers. That's just an opportunity for them. So that's actually three. I don't want to talk about the book. Let's not talk about the book. (laughs) 
we'll talk about live streaming. What a concept. That's what we're talking about today anyway. Perfect. Okay, FBP family, stay tuned for next week's episode with Sarah Cooperman, and we're going to talk about live streaming. Hi everyone, Chantal here. Thank you for joining me for this week's throwback episode, that part of the show where we take a little trip down memory lane as I share some of my all-time favorite episodes from the first five years of the show. This week, we step back to 2018 when I interviewed Chief Viral Officer of Sneeze It, David Steele. I first met David at the Motionsoft Technology Summit. He is a wonderful person, an incredible operator, and he is a master in the subjects of attracting prospects, building a lead pipeline, and converting those leads into customers. His episode was number 201, and it was called Five Ways to Increase the Quality of Your Leads. So during that catch-up, we spoke about why quality is more important than quantity when it comes to generating leads. He shared five ways that we can increase the quality of our leads and tips for converting leads into customers. If you haven't yet heard that episode, then take a listen today by clicking on the link in today's show notes or simply head to fitnessbusinesspodcast.com and search for episode 201. Happy listening. FBP family, thank you so much for joining me for this week's show. And just a reminder that all resources and links for today's episode can be found at fbp.com. Now here's a message from our founding partner, Active Management. Hi, FBP family. It's JT from Active Management, the founding partner of the Fitness Business Podcast. Thanks to the amazing technology at our fingertips, we can now work with clients all over the world. But right now, you can join the free online Active Management Facebook community. It's an amazing group of people just like you. Sure, I share weekly resources, but it's the power of the community that you will experience that will make this your go-to Facebook group. Remember, it's free, fun, and inspirational. Go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Active Management Community. What you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others.